This video will give you an overview of Chapter 2, How to Organize Data. Before we get into how to organize data, we have to understand the different types of data. So, first, we have a variable. Your variable is any characteristic that varies from one person to another. This is what we are going to be measuring. This is what we're going to be looking at throughout the whole semester in statistics. There are two main types of variables, qualitative and quantitative. Your qualitative variables are your non-numerical valued variables. So this is things like hair color, eye color, um, political party, anything that is descriptive. Quantitative are your numerical valued variables. The numerical valued variables, the quantitative ones, can be broken up into two different types, discrete and continuous. Your discrete variables are those that can be listed, or we like to say can be counted. The number of students at RVCC that commute more than 20 miles, we can count those number of students. But if I wanted to know, I don't know, the time it took for a student to commute, the actual time itself is continuous because you can't necessarily count it. In other words, between, say, one hour and two hours, you can break it down then into minutes, seconds, part, parts of a second. If you can break a number down into various amounts in between the two whole numbers, then it is continuous. So we have variables. Variables that are qualitative are just qualitative. They're your descriptive variables. Variables that are quantitative are those that are numerical, that either can be counted, meaning they're discrete, or cannot be counted. They are continuous. So what I want to do is give you a listing of some variables. And I want you to hit pause on the recorder on the computer and just classify them as A, qualitative or quantitative discrete or quantitative continuous. So each of these three is each of these variables are going to fall into one of those three categories. Then when you turn the hit play, you can see how well you did. So let's see how you did. The type of pet you owned, that's qualitative. Whether you have like I have a Chihuahua, I have a Yorkshire Terrier and I have a toy fox terrier. They're qualitative descriptions. A dog's weight, though, is quantitative continuous because between, say, 9 pounds and 10 pounds, my dog's weight will fluctuate. And technically, there are infinitely many numbers between 9 and 10 when you consider weight. Normally, we just break it down into ounces but you could get a weight down to say 9.1256739, whatever, however many decimal points you choose to take it. That's continuous. Political party affiliation, qualitative. Number of students in a class, we can count that. That is quantitative discrete. Eye color is gonna be qualitative. Time, time is always continuous. Yes, we can count seconds yes we can count minutes yes we can count hours but between minutes there are multiple infinitely many measurements so that is continuous the grade on a test that's me counting the points and giving you a score so that would be quantitative discrete money so many people would argue that you can count money and that is true you can count the change in your pocket you can count the money in your bank account so for the most part money is quantitative discrete but when doing calculations in banking and with taxes and things some people would argue the way you use money it is actually continuous so that one tends to be left up to how it is used but for the most part we would say money is quantitative discrete now Organizing qualitative data. We will not spend a lot of time on qualitative data in this course. We'll be working mostly with uh, quantitative data, with numerical data, but we can organize it. 
And the best way to start organizing qualitative data is using a basic frequency distribution. You've seen tally marks before. So this is counting up how many of each category and making a tally. For example, if we were looking at the political affiliation of students in our course and we found, you know, the first person was Democrat, the second one was Republican, the third was, I think O stands for other, Republican, Republican, and so on and so on and so on, we would have this list of political party affiliations. Then we can create a tally. And here's what a frequency distribution might look like. We'd start a table. There are three possible, po there are three possible outcomes, Democrat, Republican, other. This tally, so this would be five, 10, 13. Frequency represents, the frequency is also characterized by a lowercase f. And you'll have the frequency of each. Now, fre frequency is nice if we know the total. But if two professors are talking, suppose there's a conference, they're coming from different parts of the country, and someone goes, oh, I have 13 Democrats in my class. Someone else says, well, I got 13 in mine. So we must have the same amount. Is that necessarily true? Well, what if one professor had 13 out of 15 and the other one had 13 out of 100. That's a big difference. So we have to move on to what we have call a relative frequency distribution. Relative frequencies um, is where the frequency is relative to the total number. So let's change our last table. So that 13 out of 40 becomes 0.325 or 32.5%. 18 out of 40 becomes 0.450 and the other becomes 0.225. When you are working with relative frequencies, when you add them up, if you have used every category that's listed and every person in the sample is represented, your relative frequency should be one. Now, it's not always gonna be exactly one because sometimes you're going to have rounding issues we might get like 0 0.98, 0 0.99, or 1.01, .01, something along those lines. But that's close enough. So there's a lot we can do with the data once we get these relative frequencies. Um, often when you see qualitative data represented, you may see things like a pie chart. Here the percents are taken, that 45% Republican, 32.5% Democrat. And there are percents now of a circle and it represents, so the 45% is almost, you can see it is almost half the circle. So that's one way. Another way is a bar chart. Now I want you to keep in mind, um, this is a bar chart and this will be very different from histograms that we're gonna do with quantitative data. In the bar chart, we have the three categories, Democrat, Republican, and other, and we notice we're using the relative frequency, so the percent, um, that they each go to is represented on the y-axis. The categories are across our x or horizontal axis. And a couple things I want you to note. You see the spaces between the bars. That's what makes this a bar chart and not a histogram, which is what we're going to do later. Bar charts are used to represent qualitative data. Now I want to move on to organizing quantitative data. When we organize quantitative data, we do it depending on the data we're given, generally three different types. We have um, single value grouping, which is gonna look a lot like our qualitative data, which we're gonna go over first. We have limit grouping, and then we have cut point grouping. The limit grouping and the cut point grouping will depend on if you have continuous data or discrete data. So let's start with our single value grouping. Now, why do I say this looks a lot like qualitative data? So in this particular example, we have the number of TV sets in each of 50 randomly selected households. So household number one is one TV. Household number two is two, one TV and so on and so on. The reason I say it looks a lot like quality because there's only so many categories. You can only have so many TVs. 
You either have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It does not appear that anyone in this group had more than six TVs. So it's called single value because there's so few single values that we can have each single value as its own category when we do our frequency table. So if you'd like, hit pause for a second and go and set up a tally and determine the frequency for each of these values, zero through six. Your tally should look something like this. We had one had zero. So notice we have our frequency column, which again is always designated by an app, which has zero through um, the number of TV, number of people that had zero, number of people who, number of families that had one, and so on and so on. That should always total whatever our sample size was. And then we have our relative frequency. That's where in this case, you're gonna take each of these frequencies, make this a little bit bigger, there we go, each of the frequencies and divide by the total. So 16 over 50 and so on and so on. And notice we just need to round to two decimal places is fine. This one does happen to add up to one, but as I said before, you, depending on how you rounded, it could be 0.99 or 1.01. .01. So this is a basic frequency table for single value grouping. But would single value grouping work with this following data. So how many days does it take for a short time investment to mature? So here, the first one took 70 days, the next one took 64, 99, 55, 64. Okay, we have a couple values that are in common, but not a lot. Single value grouping really would not work really well for this. You'd have way too many categories. So when you have too many categories, this is where you bring in um, limit grouping. So when you're doing limit grouping, you have to think about a few things because we're gonna make classes. We're gonna organize our data and our numbers into classes. And then each of our classes is going to have a lower class minute limit, which is the smallest value that can go into it, an upper class limit, the largest value that could go into it. There's going to be a width for each class and a class mark, which is the average of the two class limits. So this is where you have a little bit of leeway in how you set up your classes, but I urge you to do something that makes sense. So for example, when we look at this data, okay, a couple things you need to do, need to figure out first when you're setting this up. What is the absolute lowest data value we have here? I think we have something in the 30s. It looks like the 30s. And then the highest value seems to be in the 90s. There's a few values here like 99 in the 90s. Um, you don't necessarily start with your lowest value. In other words, we're not gonna start with say, I think the lowest one is 36, but I'm not gonna start with 36 and call my first group 36 to 43, and then go 44, because it just doesn't make sense. Clearly groups of 10 make a lot of sense. So you've got the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Sometimes there's too much. You have to do groups of 20. Um, sometimes you've got to break it down to groups of five. But starting on those numbers that end in zero just make the data visually easier to review. Also, your classes must be consistent. Every class width must be equal. You cannot go 30 to 39 and then go, oh, I'm going to go 40 to 59 because there's so few numbers. It must be equal across the way. 
All right, so let's take a look at what this, so you can stop and kind of try it out on your own first to see what your frequency table is going to look like. Okay, our table here, if we start and do 30 to 39 is a very reasonable um, class. 40 to 49, and then we go up 90 to 99, and do your tallies. You don't have to do the tally comment column. You can just do your frequency column. Just ensure that you've got everything. It does add up to the sample size of 40. Your relative frequency, in this case, each of these numbers, sorry, is going to be divided by 40 to get the relative frequency. And let's talk for a minute about two things. The first one is the class width. How wide is the class? It is very common for you to look at this date and go, hey, they're each size 9, because 39 minus 30 is 9. But that you know that's not true. Um, if you actually count on your fingers from 30 to 39, including 30 and including 39, it's not 9 numbers. There are 10 numbers. So the class width for each of these is going to be 10. And that's good, you want it all the same. Now the class mark, that is the average, that's kind of the midpoint of each class. And this is another one that's a little bit odd because many people might want to put the class mark at 35, 45, 55, 65, but that's not quite right. Because think about the number 35. Does the number 35 fall directly between 30 and 39? No, it is actually closer to 39 than it is to 30. So it can't be 35. So read what this says. To find the class mark, which is also called the average, class average, it's the average of the two class limits. So you would need to take 30 plus 39. So to get class mark, you would do 30 plus 39 and divide by two. And that will give you 34.5. You would need to do that for each category. For, for each class, sorry, 44.5. And then you get the idea it'll be 54.5, 64.5, right? 64.5 and so on. So be careful when calculating class mark and follow the directions and the formula there. So class mark becomes really important because what if, for example, we were not given the original data. So if you're given original data and if you're given the original data and you were asked to find, say, an average, you could just add up all those numbers and divide by 40. But if you're only given the frequency table and you, you don't have the original numbers, you all you know is that three numbers fall between 30 and 39. What you would do in that instance is say, if I wanted to find the average of everything, I would have to say, okay, I've got three, let's estimate it at 34.5. And then I have one between 40 and 49, but you don't know what it is, so it would be 44.5 plus one at 44.5. Then I've got eight numbers between 50 and 59, so I'm going to just say eight of them are 54.5. So where class mark comes in handy is if you're given a frequency table of data where you don't have the original data values, what you do is you use the class mark and the number, the frequency of values that are in each of those class marks to get an average. Will it be accurate? Nope, but it will be close enough. It's called a group weighted average. So that's why class mark comes in handy, comes in handy for grouped data.
where you don't have the original data set. It is a way for us to get an average. Now, let's suppose, for example, we were working with continuous data. Say weight. And weight is listed to the nearest tenth of a pound. So you have a bunch of different weights, 133.6. 128.1, and so on and so on. So when we talk about cut point grouping, we actually need to develop a cut point because of it is continuous data, and we might say, okay, our cut point is everybody from 120 pounds to under 125. Meaning, if somebody's 124.8, they would go in this category, but the second they get to 125, they're gonna move to the next category, to under, 130, 130 to under 135, and 135 to under 140. So this is what cut point grouping would look like, and it works for continuous data. You need the lower class point is the absolute smallest number that can go into that class. So for example, 125 would go here, but 124.8 would have to go into this category, the 120 to 125. Um, the largest value that can go into the next higher class. So what happens is we can't put 124 here. Do you see that? Because if I put 120 to 124 and then 125 to 130, where does 124.8 fall? It can't. So that's why we don't include 125 in that first class. We would only include, we would have what, two numbers in that first class. We would have one number in the second class. I have one number, the 133.6 would go into the third class. And I'd also have one number in the class of 135.9 would certainly fall in that fourth class. So the class width in this case is the difference between the cut points. So the cut points are 120, 125, and you would, the class width would be that difference. So yes, the class width for each of these would be five. 125 minus 120 is five. 130 minus 125 is five. And the midpoint is the average of the two cut points. So if you took 120 plus 125, divided it by two, we get 122.5. So cut point grouping is for your continuous data. And then your limit grouping, of course, is for your quantitative but discrete data. Now, how do we display this data? We can display quantitative data after you get your frequency tables that kind of give you some information in various graphs, but it really does depend on what type of data we're starting with. So histograms are good for all types of data. Dot plots work great for single value grouping. You'll see that in a minute. And stem and leaf diagrams will work good for discrete data. 
So let's go back to our tele here. I'll scroll up for a second so you can remember our television data, which was this first set. We used single value grouping for the television data. Sorry, I'm scrolling, but it makes it easier to go through these slides. Okay, so single value grouping, the way you would do a histogram with single value grouping, and I want you to pay attention to this. The numbers themselves, look at the bottom of the screen, are actually, each of them are directly in between every bar for these histograms. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is this is not a bar chart. When we're dealing with quantitative data, those bars get to touch each other and they're squished together. There is no space. You put a space in a bar chart because the qualitative data have no relationship to each other in a numerical sense. But here, zero is followed by one, is followed by two, is followed by three. So they have a relationship. The bars need to touch each other. So single value grouping, take note when you draw a histogram. Those numbers, they do not appear on either side of the bars. They appear directly in the middle of each bar. Also, the first histogram you are looking at over here, is a frequency histogram because it's using the full frequencies. The second one you are looking at is a relative frequency histogram, which is using the relative frequency. So on a test or anything else, please pay attention to which one you are supposed to make. Ultimately, they have the exact same shape. The only thing that is different is the values on the vertical y-axis. Now, our limit grouping data, which was our days to maturity, this is what we used with discrete, we can count number of days. For this one, take note, we had made our limits, they went from 30 to 39, 40 to 49. That was what our class, our class sizes were. But you're not gonna write 39 and 40. So what you use on the histogram is simply the first number of each lower class. So let's look up at that table again so you know what I'm talking about, this set of numbers. That's what goes on your histogram for the limit grouping. Okay, so you just go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 90, 100. Again, same idea. This is your frequency histogram and this is your relative frequency histogram. Now dot plots. Dot plots are great for single value grouping. They give an awesome visual, but they really only work when you have a few. They can work for discrete if you have a lot of repetition. Dot plots don't really work well if there's no repetition in the data. Because what they do is, here's, um, for example, price in dollars of 16 DVD players. Nope, this is clearly um, hasn't been updated in a while, this textbook, because nobody uses DVD players. But here we go. So we have multiple at 219. Do you see that? One, two, three. We have a couple at 210, multiple at Oh, here was two, 219, sorry. This was 199. We had multiple at 199. Apologize for that. 212. So as you can imagine, a dot plot really doesn't work well if you don't have some values that are multiple. But they, they give a nice shape of the data, and shape of the data is something we're going to be talking about. Okay, the other one is a stem and leaf. So days to maturity for 40 short-term investments. So the way a stem and leaf works the stems are your, um, in this case, we only have numbers that have tens and ones, right? So the stems are, are tens, are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90, and the leaves are the single digits, all right? So here, construct a stem and leaf. The easiest way to do it is you look at your data, you say, okay, I need everything from the 30s to the 90s, and then go through and start putting in numbers. So you'd put a zero, that was the first thing that was listed, the zero at the 70, a four 
or I guess they went down. So they have the two at the six and you keep going. Of course, you should always redraw it in order. It makes much more sense. So then all you have to do is take the eight, six, nine, turn it into six, eight, nine, seven, and put each of those um, set of leaves in order. So stem and leaves are another way to give a nice visualization of the distribution of your data. So I'd like you to go ahead and try a stem and leaf. Now, I will tell you for this particular one, you do not need, you would have in this case, two digits could represent your stems and keep the single digits as your leaves. So sometimes there are so few stems that we really don't get as good a visualization from our data as we do here. So often what we can do is break our stems into two and put say zero through four on the first one and five through nine on the second one. So let me show you what I'm talking about. In this case, I would have two 19s, two 20s, whoops, two 21s and two 22s. Now the first one, the first stem of that number is only going to have the numbers zero through four. So the first one will be empty because there is there is there's only one nine and that would go here. But let's take a look at 20. I would put zero two three on the first one and seven eight eight nine on the second. For 21, I'd have all the zeros. There's a bunch of them. Four zeros, yep. Yeah. And the two three, four, but then I move the five, seven, eight, eight down to the second one. And for 22, I just have a one. So it gives a little bit of a better shape to our data when, if there's ends up being so few. It's just a different way um, to represent it. And why do we need to represent the data well visually? Is because we need to understand the shapes. Um, the shape of our data is going to become quite important as we get more into inferential statistics toward the end of the class. But let's take a look. The distribution of a data set is a table, graph, or formula that provides the values of the observations and how often they occur. So that's what we have done so far. We've looked at the, we have taken our data and we've distributed it. We looked at the distribution of our data. You are very common with the most, and I'll call it the most frequent distribution, the normal distribution, which is called our normal curve. It is this bell shaped distribution. Um, here's a frequency table. If you do a histogram, so this is a frequency table put into a histogram that would show you very clearly a normal distribution. So these are the heights of 3,264 female students who attended a Midwestern college. So height is considered very normally distributed, meaning there's a common height where the majority of the population fall then there's a few people as you head that are much shorter, and then a few handful of people are much taller. So that's why height is used here. It just shows a very nice normal distribution, but not everything is normally distributed. Not everything has this bell-shaped curve. Here's just a nice little visual, some distributions. There's a lot of them. There's the bell. They can be, it can be way more extreme and be triangular where there's a consistent increase going up and that same consistent increase going down. It can be completely uniform. 
height is obviously not uniform, um, where whatever the lower numbers are has the same occurrence of every number across the data set. You've got these J-shaped regular reverse J and then a J-shaped curve. Now, the ones that you really need to know for this course, obviously the bell-shaped curve. The other ones I want you to pay attention to are a right skew and a left skew. And the first thing I want you to notice is for a right skewed graph, the bulk of the data notice is to the left and the tail is heading to the right. That's what makes it right skewed. Okay, normally it means there are some crazy data values out here that's pulling it to the right. The same is going to occur with left skewed data. The majority is, looks to the right, but then there's some crazy data values that are pulling it to the left. That's why it is called left skewed. We also have bimodal data. That's kind of like where there's two areas that are showing um, the majority. And we have multimodal data. But these are the three that I really want you to pay attention to. And those are the three you're going to be asked about on quizzes and tests. So let's take a look at a relative frequency histogram um, for household size. So the number of people that live in a house. As you can imagine, there's a large... Okay, so if we talk about um, households in, in America, a lot of them have singles or single, so a lot of them have one. There's a lot of two-person households that make sense, older couples living together. Um, three and four-person households, so these are families, five, six, and obviously it is not the norm to have seven people living in a house in our particular country. In other countries, it could be. So this is, so think about it for a minute and tell me what type of distribution do we have? Okay, we have a right skewed distribution. We have a right skewed distribution because we've got a few people here where the majority is just one or two, the first possible data values. We have a very few people heading out to the extremes of six and seven people. That's kind of pulling the data to the right. So a little bit about um, distributions. The distribution of population data is called the population distribution or the distribution of the variable. Um, and the distribution of sample data is called the sample distribution. So um, we talked a little bit earlier about the difference between the population and the sample. This is going to come back to us after we complete our section in probability. Midway through the course, we're going to look at um, sample distributions and how sample distributions um, will then allow us to move into inferential statistics. Okay, so here is a population distribution. And I want you to take notice that each of these represents six different samples taken from that population. Notice they are not identical to it, but what can you say about their actual distributions? They're very similar. So the population data could have been taken from a census, and then these are just samples. And notice in the sample, occasionally you come across one like this one here that in that particular sample, it didn't have anybody that had seven people living in the house. Um, a few of them didn't, actually. There's quite a few that didn't have seven people living in the house. But the general shape of the sample distribution, if the sample is taken correctly, will match the population distribution. So for any simple random sample, the sample distribution approximates the population distribution. Obviously, the larger the sample, the better the fit. And that's going to be a reoccurring theme as we move through the course. The bigger the sample, the better um, fit 
and the better information you're going to gain from it. Um, the last section our text is very brief in this chapter just very briefly discusses um, misleading data. And I want you to look at this real quick. From 1998 to 1999, there was a massive increase in home price. This was um, could have been a, a graph that was published under a newspaper heading. The, have, the average, look at the huge increase in average home prices in just that one year. This is a very misleading graph, and hopefully you can point out some of the areas where you find it misleading. So I'll let you think about that a second, but clearly one of the things I notice is, number one, it's starting at 79,000. Okay, it's not starting at zero, as your graph should start at zero. So if we standardize this graph a little better and start it at zero, do you really see much of a massive increase in homes? So there's a lot of ways that graphs themselves can be misleading, and you'll have a couple homework problems to go through that. So this concludes the overview of Chapter 2.